Hello, and welcome to The Excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. If you're a parent or know someone with young children, you've heard the complaint. Child care has long been unaffordable, costing families more than $10,000 a year on average. And more than half of Americans have no access to child care at all. They live in what are called child care deserts. Meanwhile, the end of COVID-era child care subsidies have forced some providers out of the child care business. What's the solution here for working families? Our guest, Julie Cashin, is the director for Women's Economic Justice at the Century Foundation. Thanks for being on the excerpt, Julie. Thanks for having me. You recently testified in Congress about the issue of the growing lack of access to child care for some families. What is it that you find most alarming about this issue? Most families need childcare at some point. The majority of parents are working, whether it's a solo parent household or a dual parent household, the majority of parents are in the workforce. And so that means that their children need a safe nurturing place to go when they're at work. What the problem is, is in the United States, We do not have a plan. We don't have a system. We, you know, got really close uh, in the Build Back Better Act to building a system, but it did not happen. And that means that it's really a DIY, do it yourself kind of a thing. But we also know that it shouldn't be every family for themselves. This is a systemic problem. And when we invest in our children, everybody's better off. So, in helping families to solve these individual problems, we'd actually be helping all of America. What can legislators do to help stabilize child care across the country? And what would that mean for economic mobility and poverty in the United States? President Biden's plan and the Build Back Better plan would have made such a difference. It would have basically made it so every family would have access to affordable childcare, would have built out the options so that families have lots of choices. It would have had enough public resources that we could raise the wages of early educators who are currently paid poverty level wages, but in a way that did it so that that didn't come out of a parent's pocketbook, that didn't come out of a parent's wallet, that it came out of the public sector so that we'd be investing in the best early educators to give our children the best possible start in life and partner with their parents to provide that kind of care. That's the vision. In addition, during the American Rescue Plan Act and the previous COVID relief packages, there were billions of dollars that were historic and unprecedented put into stabilizing the child care sector and supporting families. That money has either run out or is about to run out. So we have asked for $16 billion in additional funding to continue to support the sector in the short term while we work to build toward those long-term changes. What are some of the most innovative solutions to help families get access to child care? Are there any promising new technologies on that front? The bottom line is that the thing that will make the biggest difference is these public sector dollars that we're talking about, because really it shouldn't be parents versus providers, right? Where parents can't afford to pay these high prices to pay higher wages for early educators. We are seeing the private sector come in as well. We are seeing more and more public-private partnerships. I have questions about how do we make sure that we're getting access to everyone who needs it, how we're not just favoring certain employees, right? You don't want to have to win the boss lottery to get child care for your kid. So relying on private sector solutions uh, doesn't always work and it doesn't get to everyone. That being said, some of the innovations I'm seeing are around data, especially. And I think a lot of times people are really hungry for data. And so the companies that are building out the ability to find out, you know, what what's the availability of child care in, a, in an area? Where can I find child care? Who's providing it? Where are the biggest gaps so we know what needs to be filled? I think that's incredibly helpful. Another thing I would look at is industrial policy. So the United States put something like $2 trillion into building out manufacturing, building out our climate change 
physical infrastructure. In doing that, we need to hire millions of more people. That's going to include a lot of parents. And so making sure that some of those dollars go in to supporting a care infrastructure is important. And in, in fact, the Chips and Science Act is a policy where many companies are going to be getting these grants or have already gotten these grants to build out semiconductor manufacturing fabs around the country. And Secretary Raimondo has said they have to have a childcare plan in place when they get this funding if it's more than $150 million. So that's also leading to some innovation where someone like Micron in New York State and Idaho are really thinking about how do we get childcare that works for not just the employees, but also the surrounding communities? How do we make sure that center-based care is available, that we have home-based care available, that parents know where to go to find child Childcare. Who are the people most likely to find themselves in childcare deserts? Is the lack of access to any childcare at all primarily a rural issue, or is this happening even in heavily populated areas? We are seeing childcare deserts all across the country in every type of community. Certainly in rural areas, it is more of a challenge. And people who are living further apart you know, it becomes a bigger issue because commutes are more challenging. But we know that people in suburbs and in cities are sometimes commuting an hour to drop their child off at childcare and then continuing on another 40 minutes to their job and then back at the other end. That means that they're spending less time with their families. That's not what we want as a country. We want to make sure that people in every community have access to childcare that works for them, that's convenient, that's safe, that's nurturing to their children. What other factors such as race and socioeconomic status play into whether a working family can access care? Certainly race plays a factor in the access to child care. For one thing, right now we have a system where those who have the most wealth have the most access. That's not the way it should be. Every child, regardless of their race, their zip code, their family's income deserves to have great care that sets them up for success and that takes care of their needs today. It helps them meet their social emotional needs that really teaches them language skills that gives them the things that they need in life, right? And that gives them the love that they need too. And right now what's happening is that because of, you know, the history of wealth in America, where white families have more wealth because of the history of slavery, that means that a lot of families of color are less resourced to reach out and get the child care supports that they need. There's also the fact that in communities of color, there is less child care options. So it does really, unfortunately, break down by race. Access to child care is, of course, essential for working parents. But as you've shared, there are many families who simply can't afford it. How is that impacting the economy? What that means is that there are losing out on economic security. And we know that economic security matters to children, that in less economically secure households, that children may face more stress, more health issues. And so the more that we can support parents to be able to work and be there for their children, the better off their children will be and the better off the economy will be. We know that when we invest in child care, that actually yields billions of dollars in the economy. That means that employers can rely on their employees to have fewer child care disruptions that impact the productivity of the business. It means that there's more money in the pockets of parents that they can spend in the economy. 61 years ago, when President John F. Kennedy signed the Equal Pay Act, he noted that the next step was investing in child care that we can't have equal pay between men and women if we don't also invest in childcare. The two go hand in hand, and it's been recognized that way for more than 60 years. What are some of the biggest hurdles in implementing solutions to the issue of access to childcare and affordability? The number one issue in access and affordability is really having the public funding to do this well, right? We don't ask parents to carry the full freight of K-12 education. Majority of parents know that their child can go to third grade. They don't have to write a check for the building and the teachers. That's not how it is for child care. For child care, most of the time, the full freight is paid by parents. 
and it's just not affordable. So solving for that requires that we invest the resources, that we have the political will to do it. We know we have the money to do it. There's trillions of dollars in in corporate tax breaks and tax breaks for the wealthiest families that are going to be considered this year as the, the Trump tax cuts expire in 2025. And though that money could be used to invest in the care sector, that money could be used to think about what do children need, what do everyday families need, and that would make a huge difference. So I think we have the solutions, we just need the political will to implement them. Can you offer any advice to working parents who are struggling right now to find or maintain access to consistent, affordable childcare? I think number one is just you are not alone. So often we internalize this as this is my fault, right? And even, you know, critics say this, right? If you can't afford it, don't have kids. That's not, kids are not a yacht, right? Like this is not the same thing, right? We all have an interest in the next generation. We all should care about all of our children. And so I think starting to see this as this is not a personal failing, this is not something to feel guilty about, this is a societal problem, and it's something that can be solved. So if you're facing it right now, it is really hard, but there is help out there and there are childcare options. And I think there are lots of creative ways to get at them. There is a federal program for the lowest income families, and it's been made more accessible over the last few years as a result of the pandemic. So if you have a low income, you may be eligible for the child care development block grant. In addition, if you're a higher income family, you're probably eligible for the child and dependent care tax credit. That's only something that you can get at tax time, but it does reduce some of the bill. So we do have some things in place already, and please, Speak up, tell your stories, because I think the more we see each other in each other's stories, the more helpful it will be for social change. Can you give us an example of a city or even a state that is getting it right on the issue of child care? I'm really excited about what's happening in the states this year. We have seen more progress on child care over the last few years than we have since I've been doing this work at least a decade. So in Vermont, we are seeing huge progress. They had a 10-year campaign where they have now achieved significant funding for child care. It's going to lower costs for families. It's going to expand supply. Similarly, in New Mexico, they had a ballot initiative where they dedicated $150 million a year toward child care and early learning. So they now have a dedicated source of funding every single year to support families, to get more childcare to families that's affordable, where early educators get a raise as well. Minnesota has made progress as well. Also Massachusetts, um, they have invested in the providers. They have invested directly in expanding supply and making it easier for people to run childcare programs because they now have access to the capital they need to pay the teachers better, to pay their rent every month, to pay their utility bills. It is long past time for us to invest in a comprehensive childcare and early learning system that guarantees great childcare for every family who needs it and wants it. And do you know what the next step of that would be? Like the very next thing that you'd like to see? I think that the care agenda, the issues around care, child care, paid family and medical leave, care for aging adults and disabled people. These are going to be hot topics as we look at this next election cycle. And I think the more we hear from candidates from the presidential level to state legislators talking about these issues, the more likely we set it up for success so that when folks are legislating about it, they will have them top of mind. I think it's part of that. I'm hopeful that we see more moms in Congress, more moms elected to government, because I think that when moms are there, then we get more progress. Julie, thank you so much for joining us on The Excerpt. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.